The seas around Britain and Ireland are our biggest wilderness, covering more than three times the area of our landmass. They're incredibly rich and diverse and have the potential to be some of the most productive seas on the planet. But damaging human activity has turned them into a shadow of their former abundance. Dredging, bottom trawling, overfishing, pollution and climate change. Our destruction of the seas has been hidden beneath the waves for decades. Now, more than ever, we need our seas to return to their former strength. How can we combine our increasing demands on our seas at the same time as ensuring the health of this vital ecosystem? I think it's quite surprising that as an island nation, we kind of tend to forget about the seas around us. Um, we kind of visit them, we go to the beach, we don't really think about what's going on beneath that surface, but it's incredibly important. Our seas are immensely productive. Powered by the Gulf Stream, combined with huge tides, strong currents flow around our isles, mixing oxygen and nutrients. Because the North Sea, for example, is quite shallow, there's a lot of nutrients going into it. So there's a lot of plankton which is acting as the base of the food chain. And that's stimulating growth of everything from sprats and anchovies right up to whales and dolphins and seabirds and everything else. We have everything from basking sharks, the second biggest fish in the sea, right down to things like cold water corals, and lots of you know, unusual and spectacular biodiversity in between. Globally, the ocean provides nearly 20% of the protein in our diets. In the UK, our seas produce seafood worth over 1.6 billion pounds in exports each year, generate more than 15% of our energy, and are vital for us in the most fundamental way. It's the ocean that's the, the heart of the climate system, the regulatory system, and it's crucially important. In the last few decades, the ocean has absorbed perhaps 90% of the heat our emissions has caused in the atmosphere, shielding the land from much higher temperatures. I mean, about 30% of the carbon in the world is captured within the oceans, and it provides around about half of the oxygen. So literally, if we allow our oceans to die, we cannot survive. But human exploitation now touches every corner of this vast wilderness, where protection and monitoring lags far behind what we do on land. When you actually look at what is protected from bottom trawling, you find only perhaps 5%. And our activities on land can lead to devastating consequences along our coasts. Plastics are already found throughout the marine ecosystem, while toxins, chemicals and waste flood virtually unchecked into the sea. Things like pollution and runoff can cause excess nutrients, they can cause siltation, which might smother, for example, seagrass beds or, or salt marsh threatening the health of our coastal habitats. While out at sea, our fish stocks are continuing to decline. Up until fairly recently, there was this concept of an inexhaustible sea that we could just never do that much damage to it. It was so vast, fish were so abundant. Now we know differently. Today, after prolonged and increasing fishing pressure, we're having to work ever harder to catch fewer fish. The sort of amount of fish that fishermen are catching per unit effort, if you like, which depends on you know, how many hours they're fishing, the size of their boats, the size of their nets, that for most species is much, much lower than it was certainly 70 years ago. Only about half of the fish stocks relevant to the UK fisheries so around our coasts are considered to be sustainably fished. Today, some of the world's bigger super trawlers are operating in our waters. These floating factories can catch 
process and freeze up to 400 tonnes of fish every 24 hours. You keep doing that, you keep fishing at an unsustainable rate. Within five or maybe 10 years, you've driven the stock down to a very low level. And then you have problems because it can be quite difficult to recover it. The west of Scotland, cod fishery has declined 92% in the last 40 years, taking it to the brink of collapse. As fish stocks plummet further, coastal communities and supply chains are in a perilous position. And our unsustainable fishing practices have huge impacts on unintended species. Globally, this is causing massive losses to our most charismatic marine life. Every year, we kill around about 300,000 whales, dolphins and porpoises through bycatch. They're not going out to catch those species, but it's, uh, it's kind of an unintended catch or bycatch. Here in the UK, more than 10,000 seabirds, thousands of cetaceans and countless sharks and rays fall foul of our fishing gear each year. And our destructive reach goes deeper. We've lost 90% of our seagrass meadows and other fragile biodiverse seafloor habitats are being decimated. Imagine you went to your favorite grassland and there was a farmer plowing it up and they said, well, only do it once a year or twice a year. You would be appalled by that. But that's what's been happening in the ocean. Scallop dredging can be very damaging. So if you think about it raking the seabed, if there's anything at all sensitive growing there, they're very, very delicate. So a dredge is going to take away most of that growth, most of that biodiversity. In the UK, nearly all our scallops are caught by dredging. And the demand is increasing. I remember, like, years ago when I was scallop diving, we go down onto the seabed and we pick up individual scallops, put them in a net, and then they go up. And sometimes we're diving on pristine reefs in Scotland, more beautiful than I could possibly have imagined. At the end of each day, we would leave a buoy up so that we could come back the next day. And sometimes the scallop dredgers used to see us working and then they would come in on our buoys and, and they'd tow perfectly legally for scallops overnight and we would go down the next day expecting the reef still to be there. You know, the color, the beauty, the fish, the crabs and everything else. And it would just be boulders, just smashed to smithereens. And I couldn't believe that this could be legal. You know, it was and, it, and still is. Not only does bottom trawling decimate life on the seafloor, it releases an estimated 47 million tonnes of the carbon locked away in the seabed each year. Combined, all our activities have caused a cascade of events, putting our social and economic resilience at risk and have the potential to completely disrupt our entire ocean system. We're in a brace against time. Not enough regulation, not enough control. We are now at a pivotal point in our history. We're the generation with the technology and the power, and we do know. And with that knowledge comes the ability to act in the right ways to make a difference. By making a number of key changes now, our oceans can recover surprisingly quickly. First, we need to reform fishing practices. There is a plethora of tools out there, innovative fishing techniques for reducing the impact on marine habitats and marine species. In some areas, new technology is already making a difference. Traditionally hand-caught scallops have minimal effects on the seafloor, but can't meet the demand. But a newly discovered behavior has led to one innovation that has the potential to increase catches and reduce the need for dredging. They will literally keep sort of flipping until they get into the trap. Scallops can be lured by lights. And they'll try multiple times. If they bounce off the trap, they'll try again. So clearly there's a pretty strong drive for the scallop 
respond to that light and to get uh, as near to the light as possible. Other devices that emit acoustic and electrical signals can deter non-target species from hooks and nets. Acoustic pingers, for example, will reduce cetacean bycatch by up to 97%. Our shark guard device could reduce bycatch of pelagic sharks by 90%. OK, so we're talking about dramatic reductions here. If we want to reduce bycatch, then we either need to roll this technology out at scale or we have to shut down a lot of these fisheries. You know, the, 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 the choices are pretty stark. And they aren't expensive. The cost per kilo of seafood was about a tenth of a pence. To recover and increase our fish populations, a tried and tested method is setting sustainable quotas. What we need now is the implementation of best practice fisheries management to rebuild fish stocks, restore ecosystems, while managing exploitation at a sustainable level. And we're seeing the results with the return of bluefin tuna to our seas. So the managers in the Mediterranean for many, many years were ignoring the scientific advice about how to manage bluefin tuna fisheries. They were setting the quotas too high, so the fisheries were unsustainable. But over the last sort of five years, five, six years, we've seen them following the scientific advice much more closely, and we've seen recovery of bluefin tuna, not just in the Med, but it's spread out to the UK, to Ireland, and it shows if you listen to the scientists, you can get it right. These things have amazing potential to recover. By protecting specific areas of our seas, we provide safe havens for wildlife. 38% of UK waters are designated as marine protected areas, but only a tiny proportion offers true protection, where nothing can be extracted or disturbed. There are only four tiny no-take zones. They make up something like 0.002% of British waters. And so most marine protected areas, they either do very little to restrict any activities or they do nothing at all. No-take zones give the entire ecosystem the best chance to recover. And it's not just within their borders that we see improvements. Most fish and shellfish have open population, so once the eggs get fertilised, those tiny little baby fish drift around in the plankton for three or four weeks, and they spread out, and so effectively those protected areas are reseeding all the surrounding areas with baby fish and shellfish. Even though you're closing some areas off, it actually boosts your overall production in terms of seafood. In just one of our no-take zones, around Lundy Island in the Bristol Channel, we're already seeing remarkable results. Conservationists and fishers alike have found that the lobster population has more than quadrupled in the no-take zone, with lobster growing bigger and producing more eggs, whilst catches on the edge of the zone have significantly increased. Marine protected areas are also worth billions in terms of the benefits that they provide to surrounding fisheries. There are business opportunities in terms of supplying supermarkets with truly sustainable sources of fish. So the best way to get marine protected areas to perform well is to get everyone who uses them on side. This might be fishermen, this might be local residents, surfers, this could be tour guides. They all have a vested interest in that area. They might start off with different views, but if you go through the right process, you can find a compromise that suits everyone as best as possible. And the great thing about that is that then they will feel some ownership of that marine protected area, and they'll also respect the rules. These areas not only boost marine life, they protect and enlarge vital habitats, benefiting coastal communities and help in the fight against climate change. This is this really clever crossover area between dealing with the impacts of climate change and restoring marine biodiversity. We already know that certain coastal habitats lock away for thousands of years vast quantities of carbon. Things like salt marsh, Seagrass, these are things that we call blue carbon because they're even better than rainforests at absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. 
These natural, complex ecosystems also mitigate against storm surges and rising sea levels. Our coastal waters also provide opportunities for a whole new way of sustainable food production. On the Welsh coast, a small startup called Cara Moor is beginning to make big waves. Regenerative ocean farming is where you grow these wonderful underwater gardens out in the sea. You put seaweed and shellfish together, and then these multi-species all benefit from one another, and it creates an environment that's natural and sustainable. It's regenerating the sea, as in it's taking the carbon out, it's producing oxygen. It's regenerating a supply of sustainable food. There are careers here doing something that is extraordinary. You know, making bioplastics out of seaweed or biofertilizers. They're things that have huge, huge benefit, huge natural benefit right on your doorstep. Farming shellfish requires no feed or fertilizer. They also filter excess nutrients from our seas, improving the water quality. With over 19,000 miles of coastline in the UK, the potential for it to grow here is huge. As our use of the ocean grows, so does the demand for space. What we need urgently is a holistic, planned approach, pulling together the tools, knowledge and techniques we have and applying them in the right way. Are we going to halt the decline in marine biodiversity and are we going to promote a recovery like the government's 25-year plan sets out the aspiration to do. To achieve this, first we need to know the areas that need our protection. In Scotland, this has already begun. Mapping out where extraction is taking place, as well as their marine protected areas and wildlife hotspots. But we need this for all our waters, to ensure all future development allows our seas to recover. Business and their direct relationship with consumers will play a crucial role in this future restoration of our seas. So you've got a consumer over here who is ready for the change. You know, they understand more, they know more, they want to see action. You've got governments over here who are still trying to formulate some kind of plan, but we can't wait for that. Business is in that middle position that can satisfy their consumer because they understand that's what their consumer wants, but they can move much, much faster than a government. There's more awareness out there in the importance of consuming better, consuming less, uh, buying better products. So Finister is a brand I started in 2003 here in St Agnes. It was really born from my love of surf and the sea. It was about also starting a brand that would also give something back. So someone to really lead that, especially a business like ours where you know, there's 130 people, there's quite a product, supply chain, stores, online. Yeah, it's, it's a complicated business. Finister have a positive impact manager someone to focus this ethos and improve the company's impact on the natural world. In my opinion, the role of businesses to be uh, agents and advocates for that change that they want to see in the world. Business can have an immediate positive impact when it comes to seafood. If a business is thinking about buying non-sustainable marine food, fish or other seafood, I would just say you don't have any excuse to do that. Organisations like the Marine Conservation Society, who have their fish online guide, which rates species from different fisheries from one to the best choice to five to avoid. Those companies are very happy to work with businesses to make sure that what they're either selling in their canteens or you know, putting out at, at, at events, for example, are from sustainable sources. We must act now to ensure the recovery of our seas. By restoring our fish stocks, protecting crucial habitats, empowering our seas to become true climate heroes, and a plan for the future that has the health of our seas at its center. We can achieve all of this, and in doing so, we'll enter a rare win-win situation.
where improving nature for its own sake also becomes hugely beneficial to all of us in ways most of us have never imagined. It's good for our mental health. There's a, a concept called Blue Mind, which shows that people who go and walk along a beach or go for a swim in the ocean, they come back feeling better. If we do this, we have the power to create a balance where nature thrives and provides us with sustainable food, energy, and a place for us all to enjoy. We just need to work out how to work with what we have, not against it all the time.